Peace Be With You, a meditation delivered by Dr. Rob Blackburn on April 21, 2013 at Central United Methodist Church in Asheville, North Carolina. Our passage for this morning comes from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 21. Hear now the word of our Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. This time last Sunday, if you'd asked me what I would be preaching on this week, I would have told you on the parables of Jesus. And then I came home on Monday night and turned on the TV, and I dropped those plans. To hear Bostonians tell it, um, Patriot Day, the day of the Boston Marathon, began full of possibility. It's a rite of spring for Bostonians. Um, bright colors, encouraging crowds. The day rattled and chattered with life. It was a spring day that seemed to make everybody a celebrity, the old, the young, the black, and the white. But the brightness of that Monday was soon shrouded in great darkness. Many of us were pulled back and reminded of another day that became dark, another plume of smoke and two buildings and rubble. And once again, we're facing um, the violent and maiming deaths of um, many persons, and our hearts have been ripped open. His name was Martin Richard, eight years of age, a year ago. He was marching in a little peace parade in his neighborhood. He had a poster, um, and the poster said peace, and up above that it said, um, let's stop hurting people. And now um, a young eight-year-old boy named Martin is, is no longer with us. The violence of Boston was evil, period. One thing I think we tend to ignore when we revile it is that the perpetrators of the violence um, did not think they were doing anything wrong. They believed what they would, were doing was right, and that's what makes this week so perplexing. We have been filled with all kinds of emotion, sorrow for the victims and grieving families, feelings of vulnerability, rage at the perpetrators. We have heard all kinds of words, word after word coming from the commentation of media. But today we come to the sanctuary hoping to hear a word from God. It was after 9-11 and a Methodist minister over in the Durham area was taking care of his two boys, one six and one four, trying to watch them at the same time watching the unfolding of the, the horror of that story. The announcer came on the TV and he heard the announcer say that the president of the United States was getting ready to speak. So dad turns to the six-year-old and says, help me get your little brother quiet. The most important person in the land is getting ready to speak. Six-year-old turns to the four-year-old and says, get quiet, little brother. God is about to say something. <laughs> <laughs> this morning we come not to hear another word from a TV commentator or from our president, but hoping to hear a word from God. I find the task rather daunting. My first response um, when I find myself in the face of such social upheaval and tragedy is that um, I distrust words because every word I can think of would seem so inadequate. My, my first reaction is one of silence. But part of my calling is to, even in these moments, to attempt to speak a word from God. I find courage to do so because I do not have to speak simply out of my own emptiness, but out of a gospel of both death and resurrection that I think 
can speak into every corner and crevice of life. This morning's scripture takes us into the heart of that gospel of hope. We, we actually heard it two weeks ago from a very fine preacher, Ed Hillman, who um, did a fine job of bringing its truth alive here. But this morning, I want us to let the events of the week help us to listen again to this word, perhaps in a timely angle of vision. The story goes like this, according to John. Uh, Jesus walked into a room of little frightened, huddled group of followers. This is the resurrected Jesus. And, and that group reminded us of the huddled persons of Watertown this week behind their locked doors. And that's where they were. They were frightened. Bartholomew, for goodness sake, shut the door, throw the latch, pull down the blinds. Don't let anybody see us. They might recognize us. The air was filled with despair and fear. And Jesus walked into this room. And let us remember when he walked into that room, he bore the the visible wounds of his own violent death. I, I, I believe that terrorism often is rooted in self-righteousness gone bad, self-righteousness that grows into enmity and hatred and eventually violence. Jesus warned us against that. He thought that was a more dangerous sin than being a thief, a rogue, or a tax collector. And look what it did to him. We, we remembered that as we went through the last day, those 24 hours, last 24 hours of Jesus' life, the most religious people on the earth. And judgmentalism and self-righteousness turned on him. And that's why here, as the people of God, let us be wary of that ever creeping into our existence. I am more frightened of self-righteous people than anybody else in the world because once they think they have right on their side. They just give themselves permission, permission to mow down anything or anyone that gets in the way. They remove themselves from the web of creation, set themselves up as kingdoms of one or two, and declare war on anyone who seems to be against them. And in this passage, we see that Jesus has gone up against a couple of those kingdoms. And what did they do? They snapped them like a twig. So you would think he would come back with a little stronger advice the next time. You know, fighting fire with fire and carrying a bigger stick. But he doesn't. He walks into the room. The wound's still visible. And what does he say? Peace. Peace be with you. And he doesn't say it once. He says it three different times. One of my prayers for the families that are grief struck there in Boston this week for those families that they'll know that peace that Jesus will be more than an abstract idea he'll be the, the prince of peace in their lives it's a strong peace that he offers this doesn't come from a distant and remote Lord this comes from the Lord of life who gets into things all kinds of things he shows up um, in the darkest of moments and he is acquainted with grief and suffering and death. He comes screaming alongside of us. and He's hurt by what hurts us. And my hope and prayer is that some of those families will know that kind of peace that does pass all human understanding. But for those of us that are here this morning, that, that peace is not just a word of comfort, but it's a word of call. And how do I know that? Because Jesus says it three times, and then he says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. In the same way that I was, for the same purposes that I was, to, to work for peace, to, to make peace, even if they kill you for it. I don't think I would maybe try that message on some of the families that have been so struck by violence this week. They may not be ready for that. I, I don't think some of us are particularly ready for that. I, I spent some time this week just trying to be in different places in Asheville where people didn't know who I was and what I did, just kind of listen to people. And there was a lot of rage out there. I understand that. I mean, there's a place for righteous indignation. 
But it is going to be hard for us this morning to ignore what Jesus is saying here. This is the first sermon that he preached as the resurrected one. This is his first Easter message, and this came from a man who was murdered himself. So what does this mean for us here this morning? I don't think it means that we are less resolute in trying to bring the perpetrators of violence to justice. I do think it means that we're believers in a dream that often doesn't seem possible. We believe that the future belongs to the Prince of Peace. And we work for that even in a hostile age. Friends, those of us that are here today and carrying the name of Jesus into the world, we cannot pretend not to be related to each other. Each of us, we celebrated that in the baptism here today, is God's child, but none of us is God's only child. That's the hardest part of it. God means to save us all. Sometimes it's hard for me to understand that, but I'm called to believe that, that peace can be with us and we can be a part of it. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And we do not get off the hook just because maybe right now that's not where our feelings are. One of the burdens I have found of being a Christian is that again and again I'm called to something greater than, beyond than, larger than how I happen to feel at the moment. And when I live into that, that's not a lack of integrity. That's what it means to be called to something. And we are called to believe in the dream. And in all that we do, to always do it in peace, to stop making enemies, to Stop separating ourselves to resist ill will because ill will kills and we're never for that. And where do we begin this morning? I would suggest start small, start local. Start with some of those skirmishes that you're having at home or people you work with. Ken Burns did that great documentary on the Civil War. One of my favorite moments is toward the end of it. He talks about what happened in 1913. That was the 50th anniversary of Gettysburg. And so some of the veterans, both Union and Confederate, are still alive, and they go back to Gettysburg, and they decide to reenact Pickett's Charge. And if you know your Civil War history, you know that the Union, they were up on the high ground, they were behind the stone wall, and Pickett, General Pickett and the Confederates come out of the woods and up that grassy slope. And so they're reenacting it. The old Confederates, well, they're moving as fast as they can up the hill. The Union soldiers behind the wall, and something extraordinary happened. They didn't follow the script. The Union soldiers go rolling over the wall and start moving down the field toward the Confederates, and a great cry goes up. But it wasn't a battle cry because they got in the middle of that field and they embraced. And they wept openly. Now, I invite you to think about some of the skirmishes you're involved in locally in your life and pray that maybe you can see through the kind of eyes that those old, those old soldiers had in those Gettysburg field. That you'll see the people that you have been at war with that they have faults, but pretty much like the faults that you possess, and they have the same need and longing for joy and wholeness that you have. But then I don't think as followers of Jesus we can leave it small. We have to, to widen the embrace of our involvement, and we have to find ways to be peacemakers. That's a very proactive word. That's not just the absence of conflict. And I think one way we do that is look around the world and look for people that are involved in the struggle to make peace happen and then to find ourselves linked with them. They're all over the place. Some right here in Nashville. If you ever watched the movie Hotel Rwanda, you remember it was a it dealt with the terrible genocide, the, the Hutus who just slaughtered so many tens of thousands of the Tutsi people. In 1994, Bishop John Rianudo started what was called the Yumuvu Tree Project. He himself was a Hutu. 
And he started this project that got together tens of thousands of Hutu perpetrators of violence with tens of thousands of Tutsi victims. Their families had been victims of the genocide. And the perpetrators were asked to have a chance to confess and the victims a chance to forgive. And do you know that thousands have chosen to do so? Okay. That's what we need to do. If individually, there's a church called Central, find out where that kind of thing is going on in the world and put ourselves alongside them. But we can't stop there. It's, we, we, got, we got to keep up what we've been doing here, and that's that struggle for peace with justice to work at those root causes of terror, of hatred, of enmity. It was a terrible thing, it is a terrible thing, that on one day two people can kill or maim almost 200 persons. That was horrific. But while you and I were sleeping last night, 30,000 children under the age of 12 died of malnutrition and starvation. See, we're a people that know we don't have to wait for a national trauma to get us engaged. Time and time again, we're called to rise out of the ashes of hostility and loss and brush ourselves off and keep joining God and putting the creation back together again. Reconciling peacemaking love. Boy, it's, it's costly though, isn't it? I mean, look at the wounds on Jesus' hands. Sometimes we're just not sure we're up to it. It seems overwhelming. I, I find courage, though, when I'm reminded of the little, this, there's a wonderful note of hope in the scripture. It's easy to miss. There, there's this frightened little group of followers, and they don't even want to go outdoors. And Jesus says, receive it now. And he breathes into him, them, his very spirit. May we remember that as we make our choices. When we go where his way leads, we never go entirely alone. And it's always something more than ourselves and our emptiness and our inadequacy that we bring. And as you go where that way leads, may you remember the power, power of peacemaking love. Oh, that looks small. I mean, what I've been talking about this morning, it, it, at first glance, it looks so small over against the forces of hostility and treachery. But we know better than that. We, we have just come through those holy days. We, we saw that Jesus went against some of those kingdoms. And he did not run away from them, neither did he become one of them. The one who came from love remained love. And you say, where's the power in that? Well, for 2,000 years now, it has been making the wounded whole. We are a Eucharistic people, and we'll experience the power of that at the table again. We'll come and be reminded that the broken body and the poured out love has torn down the wall of hostility between us and God once and for all. Church is a place where peace has already been made. That this is a place of the new humanity. They become we and them become us. And ours, theirs become ours. We're, we can no longer live as though we're not related. <laughs> May we know that. Bitterness with more bitterness, no. Hatred with more hatred, no. We know the power of reconciling love the hope that puts an end to all the separation and retaliation. I love the story Fred Craddock tells. It's a family. They have this, you know, people used to take rides on Sunday afternoon. My dad thought that was a fun thing to do. I wasn't sure I believed in it, but, you know, we, he got us in the car. We're going to go for a fun Sunday afternoon ride. Why, Dad? We're just going to look around, see some things, you know. Wander a little bit. So that's what they were doing. The kids were grumbling about it a little bit, but it's good for kids to grumble. That's the way they grow up. And so they're grumbling in the back seat. And they at least are looking out the window. That's good. And 
One of them yelled, Daddy, Daddy, stop the car. Why? Because there's a little kitten on the side of the road. So there's a kitten, but Daddy, it looks really sick. And if you don't stop, I, I think the kitten may die. So the kitten may die. We already have a zoo at home, and I don't think we have room for any more animals. So Dad keeps driving on down the road, and he's just trying to change the subject. And finally, Mom, in her innate wisdom, taps him on the shoulder and says, They're not giving it up. I think you're going to have to go back. So... Not happy about it, he does the old U-turn. He goes back a mile down the road, and there's that little kitten. He says, yep, stay here in the car. Don't any of you get out of this car. I will take care of this. So he gets out of the car, and he has to admit it's a pretty sorry-looking little kitten, flea-bitten, sore-eyed, emaciated, looks half dead. Well, okay, he's going to have to pick it up. And he reaches down in the last bit of kitten energy. That cat bears his claws, tears a good little bit of skin off dad's hand. He's not happy about this now. They go around the car about three times, and finally he gets it by the back of the neck, picks it up, opens the door, and yells to the children, don't touch it, it probably has leprosy. So, they, um, they go home and, well, you know, after a couple of baths and some warm milk, about a half gallon of milk, they come back to Dad and say, Dad, oh, Dad, please don't let the kitten have to sleep out in the garage tonight. He's all lonely. He's new. He's afraid. Please let him, please, please, please let him sleep in the house. Oh, sure. Go on. Give him my bedroom. We've already turned this place into a zoo. Well, they make up a little plump little bed, a, a, a bed fit for a pharaoh. And, um, well, a couple weeks pass. And, um, in the afternoon, Dad's just come home from work, and he's walking through the living room. Feel something. You know that feeling when a cat rubs against your leg. And he looks down. There it is. There it is. And he looks around to make sure that no one is watching. <laughs> and he reaches down toward the cat. But this time, there's no bearing of fangs. The cat, you know what cats do when they arch the back? Yeah. That cat is ready to receive his caress. Fred Craddock, who told this story, said, um, ask a really relevant question at this point in the story. He said, is that the same cat? Is that the same hissing, ornery, hungry, hurt cat that had been there on the side of the road. No, it's not the same cat. And you and I, we know, we know what made the difference. You'll be coming to the table today. I want you to think not about my hands or the hands of the altar guild, but the hands behind this meal that gave us this meal. You, you look carefully at those hands. And you know what? They're covered with scratches. Such are the hands of reconciling love. May you experience the peace of it at the table, and may we not keep it to ourselves. As the Father has sent me, so I send you.